I'm Gloria Allred, and you're watching GBTV News. Thanks, Gloria, and I'm Randy Hansen. In today's world news headlines, Obama pushes for congressional approval of attack in Syria. Syrian refugees top two million. And Israel says Mediterranean missile launch that sparked Syria fears was joint test with U.S. And a report says DEA uses phone record trove that surpasses NSA's. And Brazil blasts reported NSA spying on president's communications. And a report says NSA hacked communications of Al Jazeera. And budget document shows widespread use of cyber attacks by the U.S. And Japan pledges funds for Fukushima crisis. And Egyptian judges call for dissolution of Muslim Brotherhood and Morsi to stand trial. And Egypt court orders closure of Al Jazeera affiliate and three other stations. And Taliban attacks U.S. base in Afghanistan. Number of police deaths doubles. And U.S. drone strikes hit Yemen and Pakistan and teen sentenced to three years in gang rape case that ignited India. And Medela released from hospital conditions remains critical. And Verizon reaches deal to obtain sole control of world's largest wireless provider. Diana Niad completes historic swim from Cuba to Florida. GVTV News is broadcast on Grass Valley Television, a division of Rural Counties Television Network, whose focus is on community involvement. We also air on NCTV. But before these stories, GVTV News would like to thank one of our underwriters who supports your only visual video in this media in Nevada County. That's right. It's us. GVTV News. In today's first world news story, the Obama administration is gaining ground on its bid to win congressional approval before launching a military strike on Syria. Arizona Republican Senator John McCain met with Obama on Monday along with fellow Republican Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina. After the meeting, McCain told reporters he believes the vote against the strikes would be, have catastrophic consequences. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee will hold its first hearing on Obama's proposal. On Sunday, Secretary of State John Kerry said in television interviews that hair and blood samples from Syria have tested positive for nerve agent sarin. His claims come a day after Obama made the announcement that he would seek congressional backing for military action following reports of a chemical weapons attack last month that the administration says killed more than 1,400 people outside the capital of Damascus. I think it was 390-some, and um, well, there's some other stories there, too. President Obama said, I'm confident the case our government has made without waiting for the UN inspectors. I'm uncomfortable going forward without approval of the United Nations Security Council. And so far, I've been completely paralyzed and unwilling to hold Assad accountable. Here's my question for every member of Congress and for members of the global community. What message will we send if a dictator can gas hundreds of children to death in plain sight and pay no price? A report presented to the French Parliament Monday concluded the chemical attack was carried out by Syrian, Syrian government. United Nations, meanwhile, says the number of civilians who have fled Syria has topped two million, with fears of Western airstrikes helping to fuel the flow of Syrians into neighboring countries. Protests by anti-war groups against the proposed strike are continuing across the country and around the world. There was another story out, too, that the rebels accidentally set off the house of chemical weapons. Israeli military claims responsibility for missile launch in the central Mediterranean, uh, sparking a flurry of speculation amid talks of U.S. military action in Syria. Russia's defense ministry said its warning system had detected missiles in the area this morning. Israel initially denied responsibility, but later it said carried out joint tests with the United States. 
and the new york times has revealed the u s drug enforcement administration has access to air to the records of every phone call that passes through it into the infrastructure through a vast and secretive operation called hemisphere project under the program the u s government pays for eighteen to employees to station themselves inside d e a units where they can quickly hand over records dating back to nineteen eighty seven longer period than records collected by the national security agency i guess that's what you call big brother Revelations about spying and the National Security Agency based on leaks by former contractor Edward Snowden are continuing to emerge. On Sunday, Brazilian news showed Fantastico reported that NSA targeting their emails, text messages, and phone calls of presidents of Brazil and Mexico. The news shows that dead documents provided by journalist Glenn Greenwald, who lives in Brazil, and obtained them from Snowden. They included the NSA slide dated back June 2012, before Enrico Pino Nito became president of Mexico, which included messages about the potential picks for cabinet post. Both Brazil and Mexico summoned their U.S. ambassadors following the revelations. Mexico called for the United States to investigate, while Brazil's foreign minister demanded a written explanation and suggested Brazil might cancel an upcoming U.S. visit by President Dilma Rousseff. And uh, Machado said, Today at 9 this morning, we summoned the ambassador of the United States, Thomas Shannon, to my cabinet and explained the indignation of the Brazilian government. In line of these facts contained in the documents which were revealed, the violations of the communication of Our Lady President of the Republic, from our point of view, this represents an impermissible and unacceptable violation of Brazilian sovereignty. German magazine Der Spiegel says National Security Agency documents leaked by Edward Snowden show the spy agency hacked into internal communications of the news broadcaster Al Jazeera. Washington Post, citing top secret budget documents provided by Edward Snowden, has revealed that the United States is conducting cyber attacks against other countries on a scale far wider than previously known. The report says that in year 2011, U.S. intelligence services conducted 231 offensive cyber operations. The documents also reveal a sweeping effort dubbed Genie, whereby the United States hacks into foreign networks in order to place them under covert control. And Japan is pledging to spend roughly $470 million to address a radioactive water crisis at the Fukushima Dakai nuclear power plant that was battered by the earthquake and a tsunami in 2011. The announcement comes after the plant's operation said it had detected radiation levels near a water storage tank that were 18 times higher than previously believed. A large portion of the funds would go towards building an underground wall of frozen earth to contain the leak. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said the Monday drastic action is needed. We cannot let the issue of water contamination at the troubled Fukushima Dakai nuclear plant be dealt with by only Tokyo Electric Power Company. From now on, the government will lead to provide a comprehensive solution. In Egypt, a panel of judges has called for the Muslim Brotherhood to be legally dissolved. The recommendation Monday came a day after the Egyptians' top prosecutor ordered the ousted President Mohamed Morsi and a number of other Brotherhood leaders to face trials for charges that included inciting the murder of protesters. Protests against the military-backed government have continued despite a deadly crackdown against the Muslim Brotherhood that has killed more than 1,000 people. An Egyptian's crackdown has also extended to the media. A court ordered Al Jazeera's affiliate in Egypt to stop broadcasting. The ban also extended to three other stations that were covered, covering the protests, including one run by the Muslim Brotherhood. On Sunday, Egypt deported three Al Jazeera journalists after detaining them for five days. And Taliban militants attacked a U.S. military base in eastern Afghanistan Monday, setting vehicles on fire and prompting a shutdown of NATO supply route. Three attackers were killed. The violent violence marked the latest of a series of attacks that have killed dozens of Afghans in recent days. New figures from the Afghan government show that the number of police deaths in Afghanistan has doubled this year. On Friday, U.S. drone strikes killed at least six people in Yemen. Local security sources said the dead included two top leaders of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, U.S. drone attack killed at least four people in North Warzestein on Saturday. Officials also claimed the victims were militants. A juvenile court in India has delivered the first conviction of gang rape case that ignited mass protests in December. The rape victim, Yoita Singh Pandey, died two weeks after she made, 
and the male companion were beaten on a bus in New Delhi. On Saturday, an unnamed 18-year-old who was 17 at the time of the attack was sentenced to three years in juvenile detention following his conviction for rape and murder. The sentence is the maximum allowed for youth offenders, but the family, victim's family and women's rights activists decried it was too lenient. Four adult men remain on trial and could face the death penalty. And former South African president and anti-apartheid leader Nelson Mandela has spent a second night at home after being discharged from the hospital. Mandela was 95, been hospitalized for 12 weeks with a recurrent lung infection. Spokesperson from South Africa's president Jacob Zuma said Mandela's recovery is ongoing. And, and they said former president Nelson Mandela has this morning, Sunday, the 1st of September 2013, been discharged from Pretoria Hospital where he had been receiving treatment. We would like to wish him all the best as he continues his recovery in his Johannesburg home. Madiba's condition remains critical as is, and is at times unstable. Nevertheless, his team of doctors is convinced he will receive the same level of intensive care at his Houghton home as he received in Pretoria. Verizon has reached an agreement with Vodafone to obtain sole control of Verizon Wireless, the world's largest wireless provider. The telecommunications company will pay $130 billion to acquire Vodafone's 45% stake in Verizon's wireless. According to Reuters, it is the third largest corporate deal ever announced. U.S. long-distance swimmer Diana Niad has become the first woman or first person to swim from Cuba to Florida without using a shark cage. Niad had attempted to cross four previous times, started in 1978. 64-year-old supporters were after emerging from the water and said, I have three messages. One is we should never, ever give up. <laughs> and that's it for the World News Today. Now another thanks to one of our underwriters who supports your only visual video news media in the Vatican. County. That's right, it's us, GVTV News. Soundcheck Music Center, the rock and roll connection. We have guitars, amps, drum equipment, sound accessories, lessons, and repairs. We are located at 671 Maltman Drive, Grass Valley, 530-272-7236, open seven days a week. That's right, it's time for the police blotter and pictures in the blotter, not from these actual events, but used for visual aid only. These public records are obtained from daily logs issued from Nevada County Law Enforcement. Grass Valley Police Department on Wednesday, 8.06 a.m. A caller from 10 to 1000 block of West Main Street reported someone climbed the fence at NID and stole gas. 10.42 a.m. A caller from 2000 block in Nevada City Highway reported a homeless person sneaking into a restroom. A woman was arrested on suspicion of violating probation. At 1.36 p.m., a caller from 100 block on Nail Street reported someone stole a vehicle. At 2.53 p.m., a caller from 100 block at Catherine Lane reported a man with no shirt or shoes was stealing and eating items in a store. He was arrested on suspicion of trespassing and petty theft. 3.48 p.m., a caller from 1900 block at Nevada City Highway reported locating a vehicle that had been stolen yesterday. The vehicle was released to its owner. 5.20 p.m., a caller from East Main Street and Sierra College Drive reported a physical fight between a man and a woman who had left the scene. At 7.21 p.m., a woman from 600 block of Freeman Lane reported a man asked her for a ride, then followed her through the parking lot. 11.38 p.m., a caller from Mill Street and French Avenue reported three boys in black ran through the private property. They could not be located. And Thursday, 12.12 a.m., a man from 300 block of South School Street reported a dog caught a prowler coming out of a building who said he had been reminiscing. No theft was found. 12.59 a.m., a caller from Race in South Auburn Street reported a man yelling and running up and down the road. He could not be located. 2.39 a.m., a caller reported finding a man who said he had been looking for his dog and would quiet down. In Nevada County Sheriff's Office on Wednesday, 8. 
7.32 a.m. A caller from Tyler Foot Crossing in Murphy Roads reported a bull standing in the middle of the road its owner was located. At 9.56 a.m., a caller from 13,000 block of Canopy Court reported a shirtless man waving his shirt in circles and yelling, then he went back inside. At 9.59 a.m., a caller from 12,000 block of East Bennett Road reported theft of a battery-powered grease gun. And 12.18 p.m., a caller from 10,000 block of Smith Road reported gas was taken from a vehicle last night. At 2.42 p.m., a caller from Western Gateway Park reported a woman with a child was possibly under the influence, falling down and exposing herself. She could not be located. At 5 p.m., a caller from Alta Sierra Drive and Juan, uh, oh, Joanne Way reported a man urinating on the road while walking. He could not be located. At 5.50 p.m., a woman from 23,000 block on Highway 20 reported a man assaulted her. At 5.52 p.m., a caller from Highway 20 reported a woman sitting in South Ponte Rosa overpass. She could not be located. At 6.14 p.m., a caller from the 10,000 block of Combe Road reported a 7-year-old boy wandering unattended in the parking lot last seen going down a hill in a shopping cart. He could not be located. At 6.29 p.m., a caller from Excelsior Ditch Camp Road reported hearing 30 to 40 gunshots. At 7.21 p.m., a caller from Dog Bar and Wheeler Cross Acre Roads reported people with flashlights going into foreclosed homes in the area. No one was located. At 8.40 p.m., a caller from 10,000 block of Murchie Mine Road reported someone entered a home in escrow and damaged a wall. At 9.48 p.m., a caller from 13,000 block of Golden Star Road reported a, string, a strong smell of marijuana. Nothing was located. And Thursday, 4.02 a.m., a man reported that while driving from Colfax to Grass Valley, a vehicle tried to run him off the road, crashed near Powerline Road, then followed him to Grass Valley Avenue. Nevada City Police Department on Wednesday, 7.03 p.m., a woman reported trespassers on private property on Sugarloaf Mountain. They could not be located. 9.35 p.m., a caller from Broad Street reported a theft. And 10.55 p.m., a caller from Long Street reported more than 50 vehicles all over the road, some blocking the way. And that's it for the blotter today. Now, another thanks to one of our underwriters who support your only visual video news media in Nevada County. That's right, it's us, GV TV News. Soundcheck Music Center, the rock and roll connection. We have guitars, amps, drum equipment, sound accessories, lessons, and repairs. We are located at 671 Maltman Drive, Grass Valley, 530-272-7236, open seven days a week. In today's local news, public deserves more access to its public access station, and Grass Valley officials expand on city administrators' resignation. Word of impending closure of NCTV, the Nevada County Digital Media Center, shocked many last week. Not that it was a surprise that the community public access station struggled financially, as its history has been beset with budget woes since its inception 20 years ago. Rather, because its board of directors decided to pull the plug even without letting the community in on the conversation. On August 23rd, NCDMC's president, Karen Marinovitz, who said she had been a member of the board for three months, sent out a news release announcing the August 15th decision by the board to close down the operation of the media center and its cable television channels 11 and 17. Marinovich's news release points to the recession and a forced move from previous location as the leading contributors to the station's downfall. Executive Director Lou Sitzer said that in other voice published in Friday's The Union that the digital media center's government funding amounted to 30000 a year with but its rent alone is 36. Moving to a new location causes reserving capital of decline and our operation costs were always close to the bone. Well, I, don't, I think the figures are wrong there. We'll find out when they disclose it all. A full review of the organization's budget is in order, which board members told the union it would soon be made available. Of course, last week's announcement was not the first time Western Division, Nevada County has been told its public access TV station would go off the air. How dire is it? Sister said in May 2006, NCTV is scheduled to close its doors at the end of June. That situation was eventually resolved three months later through NCTV's renegotiation of Comcast and Suddenlink's cable companies. Suddenlink, according to the union ar archives, 
added a fee of approximately eighty cents per monthly bills to help bring additional revenue during negotiations with comcast one year earlier and c t v s officials had said they needed between two hundred thousand and three hundred thousand to stay on the air caucus and conducted a survey of the customers that showed eighty percent of the respondents weren't interested in paying more money to finance facilities and production equipment for the public access station two thousand and four foothills community access television or f cat what it was formerly called which was the original public access TV station founded in December 1993, closed its doors when the Grass Valley City Council pulled the plug when it was discovered that the station's operation was in the red and planned to sell equipment to make ends meet. Council worked with then, then County Superintendent of Schools, Terry McIntyre, to keep the station live as Nevada County Television or NCTV. In 1996, FCAT's fate was on the table with Grass Valley City Council, which discussed the option of having Sierra College oversee the operations after criticizing FCAT for accounting practices that were boarding on atrocious well that was because they never had any money because the city would never give them their money when they should or enough of it to be fair while serving on fcat boards are not the same as members that are now on the digital media center in fact, a board that has seen complete turnover within the past two years, Marinovich told the unit. Some have wondered whether the announcement in the station's closure is a ploy to garner public support and funds to keep the NCTV live, but there were cases as disrespectful as it would be in the community. It would have been well-kept secret as the station producers expressed outrage over the fact they were not even made aware of the August 15th meeting that was made in a closed dis- session. Despite pledging to provide transparency to the public, Marevich told the union Friday the board's meeting was a closed session and not advertised because the board was dealing with personal matter. How a personal matter led to the closure of the station also deserves further review. Some members of the board are now scheduled to meet with other interested parties such as government officials, station producers next Thursday, and station producers. Oh, yeah, no, they're not going to let us in. They're only going to let in uh, the public in them things like that. But organizers have decided to keep that meeting closed to the public. Not allowing a community to privy to the conversation over the future of Nancy TV is misguided. Considering the organization is a community access TV station whose mission is to offer residents unfettered access to public broadcast. But Western Nevada County residents will not likely be surprised at having the door shut on such a major decision after the recent termination of school district superintendent, the suspension of the fire district chief, and the resignation of city administrators with municipal leaders in the Grass Valley, uh, said city administrator Dan Haller's resignation, stemming from an employee's evaluation that was not announced for two days because no formal action was taken by the city council on the matter. The agenda for this council's Tuesday meeting shows that the behind-closed-door evaluation of Haller was scheduled, a meeting Haller said he did not attend. When council reconvened for the public portion of the meeting that evening, Mayor Dan Miller reported no action was taken in the closed session. Hmm. I guess the good old boys are just good old boys forever. Resignations, terminations, or hires are required to be reported under the Brown Act at ensuing public meetings. Council did not reconvene in closed session after the public meeting and did not do anything other than agree on an evaluation, said the city attorney, Michael Calantuno. Calantuno, I'm sorry. It wasn't until after the public portion of the Tuesday's meeting that Haller was summoned to the meeting with Calantro, Tuno, and Miller, and he was informed the city's, the council's evaluation. There's a desire in the city council to move in a direction which Haller sees himself as not being the best fit in the city, officials said in Thursday's morning press release announcing Haller's resignation. However, Miller said Thursday that Haller was not told of any future council directions, only information of the evaluation. I frankly believe that I am not the right fit with the direction they want to go, Haller said. It would be nice for someone new to look at how to move forward. In Grass Valley, the city administration is hired by the city council and acts as a chief officer who manages the day-to-day business of the municipality, leaving the mayor role as largely symbolic. One, beyond officiating council meetings and agendas. Whereas the city's charter indicates that an employment termination would require at least four council members' approval and necessitate a disclosure of the action to the public, an employee's valuation falls under the protection of personal matter exempted from Brown Act disclosure laws they said. Tricky, isn't it? There are not, there was not a formal vote, Holler said. I don't wish them any ill or anything, Holler said. It's part of the business. Well, it's too bad because Holler is a great guy and he did a lot of good things for our community. But Holler and Miller said there's no malfeasance, wrongdoing, or otherwise illegal activities have occurred in the factor in the leadership change. Holler's last night will be September 3rd. Tim Kaiser, Director of Public Works, will act as administrator until the interim city administrator is hired and oversee the recruitment of the permanent replacement for Holler. 
city has reportedly eyed former Yuba city manager Jeff Fultz to serve as an interim leader. Miller said, however, those negotiations are ongoing. Calls to Fultz were not returned as of press time. Prior to Haller's 2008 hiring, Fultz had served as Grass Valley's interim administrator after Gene Haraldson was fired by the city council in February 2007 after 15 years in position. In Haraldson's ouster, the city cited differences over the direction of the city's future, according to the Union Archives. Coinciding with Haller's resignation are the vacancies in the city's fire department and its finance, dire- finance director, a position that became vacant when Roberta, Roberta Raper decided to position in a uh, to get a uh, position in Napa County. She's terrific. She's, we're sorry to be losing her, said Councilwoman Lisa Swartout, but she's got a good job offer. And well, that's that. The three vacancies present an opportunity for a new administrator to build his or her own staff, Holler said. It's unexpected considering the key position vacancies were are right now to have another one unexpected. Despite the, that's what Miller said. Despite the term lengths of the Grass Valley's most recent administrators, Holler said that the average tenure of a municipal executive is only about three or four years. Would I move on next week? Not necessarily, Holler said. But I think managers are, have a shelf life. You need new blood and that isn't a bad thing. At some point you have to move on. Little insight offered on these decisions. Ultimately, it's up to the public to demand the kind of access and transparency it deserves on decisions made impacting the community. But for some reason, in this Nevada County, that never happens. This editorial represents the views of the union's editorial board, which is composed of members of the union staff and informed members of the community. I just thought you might want to know about it.